people that after the The fact that I would use, uh, the fact that I would portray human civilization as still being technologically stable 80 years from now is really kind of pushing it. Uh, but I also can't write villains to save my life. My characters do all do horrible things, uh, but basically they're forced into it. They're always looking for a way to choose between the l least of the available evils. Now compare that to the real world. Uh, none of my characters would ever bomb an abortion clinic or run a plane into the side of a building at the behest of some angry sky god. Uh, none of my characters would even start a war on false pretenses for no other reason than to line the pockets of their buddies in the oil industries. My characters are all too nice for that. Um, so you could say that my writing is almost delusionally optimistic. You could say that I am almost delusionally optimistic, and I could say the same thing about most of you, and in fact I could say the same thing about most of the species. You would not know it to listen to these guys, though. Um, these guys think that science fiction is too grim and that it needs to lighten up. And today I'm going to talk about not only why I think they're wrong, but why I think that might actually be dangerous. You may know this guy, um, Neil Stevenson, Snow Crash, Anathem, uh, Seven Eves, which Obama apparently raved up, big honking science fiction superstar. You probably don't know this guy, Michael Crow. He's the president of Arizona State University. Back in 2011, Crow told Stevenson that science fiction writers were to blame for the pitiful state of the US space program. We were all too busy writing dystopias, he said. And as a result, we weren't being inspirational enough. We weren't dreaming big in a way that inspired real world rocket scientists out in the space program. Now he could have looked at it the other way. He could have said that science fiction actually gets its inspiration from science. And that after decades of corporations taking over academic campuses and decades of governments cutting back on funding for basic research, that it was actually real world science that had become pretty thin gruel, inspiration speaking, uh, for science fiction. But that's not the road he went down. And for whatever reason, Stevenson followed him down that road, decided that science fiction mattered, that it was too grim, and he basically kick-started what you might call the modern-day optimistic science fiction movement. He uh, conscripted a bunch of science fiction writers. I myself was not among them, sadly. And he got them to write a series of relatively upbeat science fiction stories set, you know, showing how we could possibly chart our way towards a positive future. And he put it all into this anthology called Hieroglyph. And because he was Neil Stevenson, he could afford to do this up really well. He took the whole lot of, he took this his whole flock of authors on this cross-country tour. They did media interviews, they did panel discussions, they toured Google, they toured Facebook. Yay, optimism, sorry about the space program, we promise we'll do better. Uh, even the Wall Street Journal weighed in and, uh, and called this an important book. And yet for all the exposure that it got, Hieroglyph absolutely tanked commercially. Uh, I know one of the editors, I know a few of the, the uh, authors. None of them saw a penny in royalties. Uh, the same could be said for another anthology of hopeful science fiction that was released around the same time, uh, edited by Jetsy DeVries, um, which was published also with exactly the same political agenda. But for all its commercial failings notwithstanding, didn't really matter. The optimism train had kind of left the station. It was barreling down the tracks at warp speed. 2014, you got Solana in Wired saying, stop writing dystopian science fiction. It's making us all fear technology. Christian Science Monitor weighs in on why we're tired of dystopias. This uh, headline down here, also from Wired, this is like about five days old. So it's still going on. 2017, uh, Kelly Robson, another Toronto writer, actually a good friend of mine, kind of stamped their foot and gave marching orders to the whole genre. No more dystopias. You can see she has, uh, she has italicized that. 
What we need is near and mid-future stories that show an array of trajectories out of the gloomy toilet bowl we're spiraling. In other words, you don't get to give us bad news unless you can tell us how to make it good. Don't you dare come up with a prognosis of cancer unless you've also got to cure up your sleeve because otherwise you're just being a big downer. Doesn't matter how treacherous the waters are that we are headed into. If you can't tell us how to get rid of the reefs and the icebergs, you don't get to talk about it at all. Now, this is a, an ideological position that I think is um, based on at least two fundamentally unsupportable beliefs. And the first is the belief that science fiction matters, uh, that the, the Honeywells and the IBMs and the Koch brothers actually do give a shit about what science fiction writers have to say. And I will grant you that it is a popular mindset these, uh, these days. Uh, you might even call it a bandwagon. We've got governments, we've got think tanks, we've got corporations, all basically piling all over themselves to recruit science fiction writers to help chart our way into a happier and more productive future. These screen grabs are from a company which, I kid you not, two days before I left for Hungary, reached out to me, big fans of my work. They want me to help collaborate in disruptive innovation, whatever the hell that is. Look at the list of of clients they've got here. I have not yet got back to them. Uh, colleges, universities are offering degrees in futurism, strategic foresight, and so on. Um, these tend to be arts colleges. Um, as far as I've been able to tell, none of them even offer courses in science. And yet, nonetheless, their administrators are shilling their graduates as world shapers, futurists, changers of the ways things are. Now, I think it's great that Star Trek communicators inspired the design of the first flip phones. I think it's great that the word cyberspace came out of a science fiction novel. These are pretty trivial events. Uh, you want to show me an example of science fiction changing the world? Uh, show me the time when a world leader read The Handmaid's Tale and said, whoa, we better dial back our support for these religious fundamentalists. Or even do you guys remember the time that Obama read 1984 and decided to curtail the NSA's domestic surveillance program? Um, I do not remember that either. And uh, in fact, I can only remember one case in point that might barely fit. And that's back in the early 1980s, a bunch of science fiction writers got into the White House and they gave Ronald Reagan uh, the idea for his strategic defense initiative, Star Wars. And we know this is a case of science fiction changing the world because, as we all know, before the SF writers got to him, Reagan was a militant pacifist who was absolutely devoted to cutting military spending to the bone. Um, to any of you who don't remember the Reagan years, I am being sarcastic. Reagan was an absolute fucking hawk. Um, but the point I'm trying to make here is that there are people in the business who seem to think that this kind of activity constitutes an act of speaking truth to power. Uh, for my part, I'm having a hard time between distinguishing that, between that and simply toadying up to power for a couple of thousand bucks a day and telling it what it wants to hear. Now, the other assumption on the part of the Give Us Solutions Brigade is that we don't already have solutions, that solutions have not been staring us in the face for decades. Uh, stop eating meat, uh, stop burning carbon. Uh, Exxon Mobil was utterly resigned to going completely carbon free, transitioning away from fossil fuels in 1980, before Reagan basically got into the White House and told them not to bother. Stop flying people like me halfway around the world for events that could probably be done almost as well in Skype or virtual reality. Might want to fix some of the bandwidth issues before that happens, but eventually that's something we should be shooting for. And above all, stop breeding. I could fly back and forth across the Atlantic every week for a solid year, and my carbon footprint would still not be anywhere close to the Godzilla-sized boot print that people stamp onto the planet every time uh, they have a kid. But oddly, these do not seem to be the kind of solutions that the, the Optimism Brigade are in the market for. 
uh, they seem to be more interested in you know, soft solutions, easy solutions, um, perhaps some kind of magical technology that will you know, save the world without getting anybody to have to change their, their lifestyles or their habits. In fact, if you were cynical, you might say that they're not really looking for solutions at all. What they are looking for is a get out of jail free card. Perfect example of this, not from science fiction, but from real science. Um, I was on a panel at, uh, in Tel Aviv last year uh, on the promise and risks of genetic engineering. And one of my fellow panelists was a genetic engineer, started a biotech um, company. And he was a very smart guy, but some of the things he said were, you know, well, you, you, can't get, you can't tell people to stop eating hamburgers. People won't stop eating hamburgers. You've got to make ecologically sustainable hamburgers. And species going extinct, species extinction, soon we'll be able to make our own species. I was like, dude, we're in the Tel Aviv Museum of Natural History. Two floors up, there is a ticker keeping a real-time estimate of the approximate number of species we have wiped out this year alone. It's on the high side of 120,000. How many of those are you going to reconstruct while you are making your ecologically sane, vat-grown hamburgers? Segwaying from science, real science, to science journalism. 2017, this article comes out in New York Magazine by David Wallace Wells. Its basic conclusion is that even the bad news you've heard about climate change is a soft sell, that things are far worse than even the experts are admitting, and that in all probability, large parts of this planet are going to be uninhabitable by the end of the century. Now, it took about three hours after this story went online before the Hope Police weighed in, trying to tear down the negativity. They uh, tried to pick holes in the science, although ultimately they had to admit that there weren't really any major uh, holes in the science. Uh, the major complaint seemed to be that Wallace Wells always chose the worst case scenario. And you know, things probably won't be that bad. Uh, Michael Mann, one of climate science's biggest rock stars, weighs in and says, there is no need to overstate the evidence, particularly when it feeds paralyzing narrative of doom and hopelessness. Uh, Andrew Dressler, climate scientist out of Texas A&M, called the article the worst, 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 worst case scenario. And, and he admitted that, you know, it might happen, but, you know, it, it probably won't. And this basically was by far the most common refrain in terms of reaction to this article. Not that Wallace Wells was wrong necessarily, but that, but that he was just too depressing. He was just too defeatist. You know, you have to give people hope. Uh, you can't be all doom and gloom. You have to start inspiring people instead. Well, as it turns out, Wallace Wells was not being too depressing. Wallace Wells was being almost childishly optimistic. Just last fall, the latest IPCC special report comes out. And its basic conclusion is that environmental disaster is now our best case scenario. And even then, only if we can go completely carbon neutral by 2050, if we cut our meat and dairy consumption by 90%, and if we come up with some new magical unicorn technology to suck out of the atmosphere all the accumulated CO2 we've been putting in for the past 200 years. If we can commit to these and other equally Herculean tasks, we may only lose up to 90% of the world's corals instead of losing all of them. Only 350 million more urban dwellers will be exposed to deadly heat events. We may actually be able to save some of the upper latitude fish stocks. Of course, the equatorial ones are gonna be hammered no matter what we do. Get the idea. Let me, let me repeat, this is their best case scenario in the event that we can keep global warming limited to 1.5 degrees centigrade. Now, as you all know, the Paris Accords, which nobody is on track to, to meet, would only limit us to two. But wait, there's more. Because it turns out that uh, the IPCC report was, let's hear it again, way too childishly optimistic did not take into account the rolling pandemics that are gonna start hollowing out our urban cores within the next couple of decades as old pathogens find new homes and new hosts in a warming world. It did not factor in 
uh, methane release from the uh, melting Arctic permafrost. Turns out that even if we cut all our emissions to zero tomorrow, temperature in the Arctic is still going to go up five degrees because we will have passed a methane tipping point. The report didn't even mention cryptocurrency. Um, I mean, why should it? What does that have to do with anything? Except now we're starting to see figures suggesting that if current trends continue, waste heat generated by the mining of Bitcoin will be enough to raise the global temperature by two degrees all by itself by uh, 2030. Latest report out of Nature Climate Change says that even if every country in the world meets all its commitments to the Paris Climate Accord, uh, which, remember, is supposed to limit warming to a merely catastrophic, which is worse than disastrous, two degrees, global temperature will still go up by three to five degrees by the end of the century. Now, keep in mind, they're not saying that it's going to go up three to five degrees and then level off. It's going to go up that much and then just keep climbing. Nobody really is spending much time looking beyond 2100, though, because, you know, really, what's the point? So, Wallace Wells, the doomsayer, the worst, worst, worst case scenario, the bringer of hopelessness and despair, was not being too depressing. Wallace Wells was being childishly optimistic. And quite honestly, when you are heading for the edge of a cliff with your foot literally on the gas, I don't think inspiration is what you should be going for anyway. I think you should be going for sheer pants-pissing terror at the prospect of what happens when we go over that cliff. Uh, the problem is not that we are too afraid to act. The problem is that we're not afraid enough. Uh, the problem is that we are, all things considered, way too complacent. Uh, one reason might be because there's this widespread belief that technology will save our asses in the nick of time. Now, you've probably heard of the XPRIZE Foundation. They're this group of technophiles, very rich people, that set out these big goals, and then they hand out big cash prizes to whatever team first accomplishes them. So basically, science and technology coupled with a good dose of capitalistic greed to help save the planet. Here are a few of their more famous contests. Uh, science fiction has also infiltrated the X Prizers, by the way. I actually am one of about a zillion SF writers on their futures advisory board. A few years back, they commissioned us all to write little happy, upbeat stories that basically imagined how wonderful the world was going to be 20 years down the road after X Prize technology had saved us all. Um, my story involved using neurotechnology to hack the 1% into killing themselves. Um, I'm kind of amazed that they still published it. But it's not just the X Prize people that fall victim to this kind of magical thinking. That IPCC report I was wittering on about the the one that basically spells out disaster as our best case alternative, that essentially hinges on building carbon sucking technology that doesn't exist yet. Uh, now, going carbon neutral is one thing. That technology exists. The price of renewables and uh, you know, solar and wind has dropped precipitously. But getting rid of the backlog, sucking back out the carbon dioxide that's already there, that's still basically science fiction technology. Uh, there are a few promising sort of experimental prototypes. Perhaps the most interesting is there's a factory currently, as we speak, in Iceland that can suck carbon dioxide out of the air and sequester it, lock it into the limestone for time immemorial. It's really, really cool technology. It can process 50 metric tons per year. Now, to put that in perspective, our global emissions are 37 billion tons per year. So you would have to scale up that Iceland factory by a factor of 624 million just to balance out the emissions that we are already producing without even touching the backlog. And yet, getting rid of that backlog somehow is the only way we can even aspire to reach the disastrous best case scenario that the IPCC set out. Now, most, if not all, of our Save the Future uh, scenarios hinge on some kind of technology of this sort. And I'm willing to even admit that as a possibility. I don't think it's likely, but it's not completely impossible. So let's presume the existence of some magical ass-saving technology. I'm going to argue that that still won't necessarily help us.
even if we do manage to invent that text, it might not uh, scale up the problem. And my skepticism goes all the way back to the 1980s, the Industrial Revolution in England, an uh, economist called William Stanley Jevons. Jevons noticed something really interesting going down with the use of coal during the Industrial Revolution. Um, he noticed that as technology advanced, the efficiency of coal-fired engines improved. And you would expect that under such conditions, the consumption of coal would decline because it takes less coal to produce the same amount of work. What was actually happening, though, was that consumption of coal in Britain was going through the roof. Not only was the increased efficiency making it more economical to ramp up industrial production in areas which had already used coal. But all of a sudden, coal had become so efficient that it could now be extended out into other industrial areas that had not previously used it. So an increase in the efficiency of the use of the technology actually increased the rate of depletion of the resource. And these days we call that Jevons paradox. And of course it applies to more than just coal. Um, if the price of gas goes down, people don't reduce their gas consumption, they drive more. A little more modern example, this uh, famous quote attributed to Bill Gates, although he has since denied making it. Yeah, right. Uh, we, of course, nowadays, 64K isn't enough for anybody. We, we measure our thumb drives in gigabytes and terabytes now, and we fill them up with cat videos and Red Dead Redemption video games, things which not, cannot by any stretch of the imagination be described as essential for our well-being and survival. If you have more of a resource to use, you will use it. Now, people still argue about Jevons' paradox, elastic versus inelastic pricing, rebound effects, and so on. Uh, the point I am trying to make here is don't count on technology to save our asses because if solar becomes 10 times more efficient, we will just come up with some way of sucking back 20 times as much of the stuff. Technology is not the answer. It's not the whole answer anyway because the heart of the problem is not technology, of course. The heart of the problem is us. Wallace Wells was not satisfied with uh, writing a magazine article. He expanded the uninhabitable earth into a book. Um, it just came out last February. And uh, I, was, I was heartened. I, I, I picked it up. I'm about a fifth of the way through it now. Um, I was heartened to see that, you know, it was sitting pretty high on the Amazon list. It was like about 132, which, you know, it's not Michelle Obama ranking, but it's pretty good for a nonfiction environmental book until I also scanned up the list and found that the 2014 edition of the Dungeons and Dragons user manual was at like 30. But anyway, much as I wish it well, and harrowing though the book is, my fear isn't just that people will see it and deny the facts. My fear is that even if people accept the facts, they just won't act on them. Current US administration's position on climate change is a classic case in point. Now, a lot has been made of Donald Trump's personal repudiation of climate change as a climate hoax and so on. The fact is the Trump administration does not deny climate change at all. The Trump administration is on record as admitting that they expect the world's popular temperature to increase by four degrees centigrade before the end of the century. And they continue to dismantle environmental protections, not despite that insight, but because of it. We're already screwed, you see. It's already too late. Um, it's too late to save the planet, so why bother hobbling short-term economic profits with a bunch of pointless environmental rec um, regulations that won't even really change anything? I said before that we weren't scared enough. Why is that? Why are we so blind to such an existential threat? Why is it that when a friend of mine, a university professor, not a stupid man, by any stretch of the imagination. Why is it that when he inseminates his wife with twins, an act which is exactly as remarkable as two dogs fucking in the street and far, far more destructive ecologically, he not only doesn't think there's anything wrong with that, 
he actually goes onto social media and brags about it. And why is it that when he does that, everybody piles on with, oh my God, you're going to be a dad, and, and oh, a daddy times two, and oh, you must be so proud. Why is it that nobody ever says, wow, 7.6 billion isn't enough for you? Why is it that nobody ever says, well done, dipshit. By the time your precious twins are in their 20s, they will be fighting over the last government rations down at the armory if they haven't already been wiped out by some mutant strain of monkeypox or starved to death because wheat rust took out the world's grain supply. And why is it that if anybody did do any of that, they would be immediately set upon as an asshole and a jerk, not because what they said was necessarily wrong, but because even facing an imminent environmental apocalypse, due entirely to the weight of our own numbers and our own first world consumption, producing more of us is somehow not only still considered an inalienable right, but somehow morally praiseworthy. Why is it that columnists in progressive climate change recognizing papers, right, snippy editorials in which they insist that not only will climate change not stop me from having kids, but shitting on people who have decided not to reproduce, calling them shamers and virtue signalers. How can Emma Tatel be so goddamn stupid? How can all of us as a species be so goddamn stupid? Well, as it turns out, because nature kind of built us that way, up until, uh, up until quite recently, delusional stupidity was a survival trait. Neuroscientist Steven Pinker in one of his books, I think it's How the Mind Works, came up with this cool little quote that brains are not truth detectors. They are survival engines. They were shaped by natural selection. They are wired to promote immediate fitness. If believing a lie has helped you spread your genes throughout our evolutionary history, then your brain will probably continue to believe that lie with all its furry little heart. And the obvious biggie here is my genes are most special, my child is the center of the universe, my family is the most important thing. And it's trivially easy to see how natural selection would make us, shape us, to believe that kind of stuff, even though we now have evidence that statistically parents are more miserable with their lives than non-parents are. Uh, but that's only one example out of a bunch of them. Here's another one. Give somebody a choice between five bucks today and 20 bucks in two weeks, and most of the time, they will choose the smaller, more immediate payoff. Now, the technical term for this is hyperbolic discounting. And it makes sense in unpredictable environments, because after all, a lot can happen in two weeks, you know? You never know, the guy who has the 20 might get hit by a bus or something. But the flip side of this is that the further away a payoff or a consequence is in time, the less real it is to the individual. And this makes it very, very difficult to internalize long-term consequences. Now, you can imagine long-term consequences, no problems. I mean, hell, we imagine sapient, smart-ass raccoons with ray guns all the time without any trouble. We do it for fun. But that's not the same as internalizing it in the gut. That's not the same as, as believing it on the level that we use to actually make our conscious decisions. You give somebody a choice between a reduced standard of living today and an environmental apocalypse in 20 years, and you don't even have to guess what they're going to do because the numbers are already in. Because it's 20 years away. Because, you know, somebody will come up with something in the meantime. Because it's all probably a Chinese hoax anyway. And at least some of you, hopefully at this time, are probably saying bullshit. You probably think I'm being way too simplistic. Um, because, you know, you don't fit into this regime too. You guys have neocortexes. You are smart, you are well-read. You can see the oceans rising and the aquifers drying up and the desert spreading. You're in, in charge of your neocortex. You're a, little bit, you're a little bit scared maybe even, and you know, good for you. The problem is there are a lot of other people out there whose brains are neurologically pretty much identical to our own. And many of them are also well-educated and well-read. Some of them, I dare say, more educated than we are. 
And yet these people will still insist, for example, that climate change is bullshit. And on the face of it, this does not make much sense. You would think that the ignorant masses would be the ones that would be the toughest ones to convince. But that as your reasoning skills improved, as your access to factual databases improved, the overwhelming weight of evidence would force you to accept the scientific reality. In fact, it actually happens the other way around. It's the uneducated who are more easy to convince. In the United States, at least, the greater your education, the more likely you are to be a climate change denier, and the better your arguments in support of that position, um, but only if you're a right-wing Republican. If you're a right-wing Democrat, um, then you will at least pay lip service to the scientific consensus. Now, there's a couple of things going on here. One, of course, is that the more educated you are, the more tools you have in your arsenal. You don't have to fall back on, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. You can actually try and poke holes in the data. Oh, look, you know, that data set isn't homoscedastic and yet using parametric stats, so that's bullshit. Or, hey, if climate change is real, how come the satellite data don't line up with the ground station data? Or even NASA found out that global warming is happening even on Pluto, so whatever is going on doesn't have anything to do with us. Now, of course, these arguments are all bullshit. They have been raised and refuted a thousand times. But the point is, a more educated denier is going to be more aware of them in the first place, and thus will be more likely to um, haul them out when pollsters and researchers come calling. But of course, it's not just climate change. And it's not just conservatives. Um, this figure I sort of cobbled together uh, from some data presented by Kay and Adele in 2013 uh, showing various American attitudes towards gun control. Um, I don't know how much of that has trickled over here, but in the States, gun control is an extremely polarizing and hot button issue. Liberals tend to believe that gun control is a good thing because if there are fewer guns lying around, fewer people will get shot by them. Right-wingers tend to believe exactly the opposite. They figure that if everybody has a gun, then crime goes down because the bad guys will be too afraid to victimize people who might be more likely to shut back, fight, shoot back. It's very little middle ground in this. This particular axis shows the likelihood, or how, how basically how good a particular group of people is at parsing data that requires a small amount of statistical acumen to interpret correctly. Basically, the higher you are in this, the, the better you are at interpreting the data. And you can see that if you show liberals data suggesting that gun control works, or if you show conservatives data showing them that it doesn't, in both cases, both groups will be very effective at correctly interpreting the data, as long as that data supports their ideological beliefs. However, if you show them data which contradicts those beliefs, if you show a liberal evidence that gun control doesn't work, or a conservative evidence that it does, all of a sudden, their statistical performance drops to the level of a functional illiterate. They start mis making mistakes. They start misinterpreting the data. Compare that to these results up here, which is what all the groups responded when they were asked to comment on the results from a, um, a study on the effectiveness of a particular kind of skin cream. That doesn't really bother or threaten anyone's worldview, and you can see that everybody basically got it right. Now, let me just emphasize here, this is not a case of people seeing data that they don't agree with and rejecting it. That happens all the time, of course, but that's not what this is. This is people seeing data that, that, that contradict their beliefs and literally not being able to interpret it correctly, not understanding it. Like, basically, ideology reduces your ability to do basic math. Now, here's the trick. It was all exactly the same data. Skin cream, gun control, works, doesn't work. The numbers were identical. All the researchers did was swap the headings on the columns, depending on the experimental treatment. And yet, even though the numbers are identical in all cases, you can only interpret them correctly when they accord with your pre-existing 
ideological belief. Belief trumps data. And where do we get these beliefs? Well, we get them, we're raised with them, we get them from our parents and our family and our bosses and our friends, basically from our tribe. They help us fit into the community. They are community standards. Nobody ever got popular in the community by telling the community that their standards were wrong. So because we have traditionally needed the support of that community to survive, belief trumps data, conformity is a survival trait. So climate change deniers, anti-vaxxers, young earth creationists, Brexiteers, these people are not necessarily deranged. They're not cognitively impaired, at least not all of them. Um, their brains are doing pretty much the same thing our brains are doing. Um, in fact, their brains are doing pretty much what brains are supposed to be doing. It's just that most people have completely the wrong idea of what brains are for. It has even been argued that human rationality itself, rhetoric, debate, uh, so-called logic, um, developed not to pursue the truth, but to win arguments and to gain social control. Uh, getting the other person to do what you want, that's what evolution selected for. Uh, logic and rationality just kind of tagged along as a side effect. In fact, on a societal level, if you put too much faith in logic and rationality, you could get your ass handed to you. The very hallmark of empiricism, the ability to recognize that you don't have all the answers, that you might be wrong, could actually prove maladaptive. Back in 2011, Ziedel produces this work of network analysis in which they show mathematically that fundamentalist dogma will become the dominant social mainstream view in any population in which dogmatic fundamentalists uh, comprise at least 10% of the starting population. Now, the, their, their argument was mathematical, but verbally it's really, really easy to, to intuit. After all, when an empiricist and a fundamentalist get into an argument, who's more likely to give way? Fundamentalists cannot seriously consider the possibility that they could be wrong about anything. That's pretty much what fundamentalism is by definition. The empiricist, on the other hand, if she's worthy of the name, has to go into every exchange thinking that she could be wrong about anything. That's what empiricism is. Now, granted, she's not going to be an idiot. She's going to want evidence from the fundamentalist, and the fundamentalist is going to be unable, probably, to, to produce any that compels. But at least it's not an ideological impossibility. So if there is any movement at all in these exchanges, it will be in the direction of inflexibility and dogmatism. The societal mean will move little by little towards the fundamentalist end of the spectrum because the very strength of empiricism, its openness to new ideas, its non-absolutism, gives way little by little to the, the rigid inflexibility of the true believer. So 10% of the starting population, that's all it takes. If you want a, an example of this in the real world, just go outside and look around. Which brings us to tribal cohesion on steroids or religion. The belief in an invisible sky fairy or fairies who reward you for good behavior by sending you to space Disneyland when you die. Now this, on the face of it, is a belief that is completely unsupportable. It's downright bizarre. And yet, uh, a lot of very, very smart people believe it. Now we know why, approximately. Conformity is a survival trait. Uh, but how did the God memes get started as a societal norm anyway? How did such a bizarre set of beliefs become so ensconced in society that they did become community standards and that you do have to conform to them? Well, a theory I'm especially fond of is that it all has to do with pareidolia, that, that cognitive glitch that allows you to see faces in the clouds, Elvis and a burrito and that sort of thing. And that in turn, pareidolia uh, results from, as the result of essentially a category error 
um, in a type of predator avoidance response. Now, as it turns out, I wrote a book a while ago that uh, explored the functional utility of religion. And so I'm going to steal, I'm going to steal an info dump from that book just to help me make the point. Look, Brooks wanted to say, 50,000 years ago, there were these three guys spread out across the plain, and they each heard something rustling in the grass. The first one thought it was a tiger, and he ran like hell, and it was a tiger, but the guy got away. The second one thought the rustling was a tiger, and he ran like hell, but it was only the wind, and his friends all laughed at him for being such a chicken shit. But the third guy, he thought it was only the wind, and a tiger had him for dinner. And the same thing happened a million times across 10,000 generations. And after a while, everyone was seeing tigers in the grass, even when there weren't any tigers, because even chicken shits have more kids than corpses do. And from those humble beginnings, we learned to see faces in the clouds and portents in the stars, to see agency and randomness, because natural selection favors the paranoid. Even here in the 21st century, we are wired to believe that unseen things are watching us. And it came to pass that certain people figured out how to use that. They painted their faces, or they wore funny hats. They shook their rattles and waved their crosses, and they said, yes, there are tigers in the grass, there are faces in the sky, and they will be very angry if you do not obey their commandments. You must make offerings to appease them. You must bring grain and gold and altar boys for our delectation, or they will strike you down and send you to the awful place. And people believed them by the billions because... After all, they could see the invisible tigers. So cut to the present. For thousands of years, people who didn't see agency everywhere were statistically maybe a little more likely to get eaten. Now that's not so much a problem these days. That might change soon. Um, but the program persists. We still see patterns everywhere. We see faces in the clouds. We see butterflies and Rorschach blots. We hear ghosts and monsters in the creaking of the stairs at night. And we can make a predictable, um, we can make a testable prediction here. Because if all of this stuff does arise from a, a pattern matching error, resulting from um, a, predator th a predator threat response, then you would expect false positive mat pattern matching to increase during times of social unrest or anxiety when people are afraid. And according to evidence out of the University of Texas, this is exactly what happens. People who feel afraid and vulnerable are more likely to see patterns in visual, random visual static. They are more likely to see conspiracies and connections in unrelated events. Belief in God and astrology increase during times of social unrest. Religion tends to prosper in areas where people have reason to be afraid. In more stable, uh, more comfy regimes, societies tend to be more secular. Now the one example you might excite in as the exception to this, the United States, world's presumably stable, only remaining hyperpower, but also extremely religious, um, is actually kind of an exception that proves the rule. Because if you look at the data closely, it turns out that the United States is not actually a developed country. Um, this shows results from 17 uh, first world nations, um, Australasian, North American, and uh, European. I've highlighted the United States in yellow here for easy identification. You've got a social metric on the y-axis here and the, f the religiosity of the society on the x. So basically, the more fundamentalist religious you are, you are closer to the left side. Of the, uh, of the graph. And for any number of metrics you'd want to name, I'm uh, showing you results from homicide rate and infant mortality. Uh, but the paper I catch this from shows similar patterns for everything from life expectancy to STDs to divorce rates to abortion rates to unwed mums. Uh, the list goes on. You'll find that the US is, of all the developed nations here, worse off on any of those social metrics. And it is also clearly the most religious 
Religious communes survive longer than secular communes do, all of the variables being equal. And within that subset of religious communes, the ones that last longest still are the ones that believe in a punitive, judgmental Old Testament God, you know, the kind that, that sees you masturbating and sends you to hell for the wicked thoughts in your hearts. Basically, Handmaid's Tale societies, those are the ones that survive longer than other even faith-based societies that believe in a, a kinder and a more loving God. Now, they think a lot of this comes down to entry and exit costs. Uh, if the cost of getting into the club is giving all your wealth to the church, mutilating your penis, uh, giving your daughter to the cult lord, what have you, not a lot of people are going to jump through those hoops. But the ones that do are going to be hardcore. They're basically in there for the duration. Uh, likewise with exit costs. Uh, if you can leave your faith by simply not showing up for, for services on Sunday, you're going to be more likely to do that than if the price of leaving involves stoning or shunning or crippling litigation if you happen to be a Scientologist. Uh, surveillance mentality also figures heavily into this. The tigers in the grass I was talking about before. Uh, there's a number of studies that suggest that communities that have a belief in a judgmental surveillant God have a competitive edge in Darwin's universe. Putting um, a picture of eyes on the wall. I'm not even talking photorealistic eyes. I'm talking about a lame ass pencil sketch of eyes like this is enough to reduce cheating behaviors during exams. So is casually introducing the word ghost into common conversation just prior to that exam. Something that abstract is apparently enough to scare us, albeit subconsciously, into changing our behavior. So basically what I've been saying for like the past half hour or more is that our brains are rotten with bias and self-deception. I have, you know, touched on a few of the biggies. Go to Wikipedia's page on cognitive biases if you want like a list of literally hundreds of others. Now these were all adaptive at some point by definition, and a lot of them still are. They all helped you to survive, but also by definition, because they're biases, they all warped and distorted your view of reality. Every one of these traits helps you to survive by lying to you. So we have an interesting tension here. You can either have a relatively clear-eyed, unbiased view of the world as it exists, or you can care whether you live or die. You can't really have both. The more you care about your own survival, the more you care about your kin, the more enthralled you are to these biases the less capable you are of seeing the world as it actually exists. Uh, wait a minute, some of you might be saying, what about science, you know? Isn't science supposed to be the set of rational, objective protocols that act as a counterbalance to all of these biases? And yes, yes, a thousand times yes. You will, you will never hear me shit on science. Scientists are a different thing. Scientists can be as big a, of an asshole and as prejudiced as everyone else. But science as a process tends to lurch on. But one of the ways it does that is by being inherently conservative. Good scientists will not publish a finding unless it has been checked, cross-checked, replicated, verified, and peer-reviewed. We don't even think that things are real unless they are at least 95% likely, um, frequently 99% likely. And uh, of course, the problem is that global systems are full of complexity and noise. And these are things that tend to degrade statistical significance, even in the event of an actual pattern. So scientific publications, almost by definition, are going to understate the degree of danger that might be inherent in any given situation. Now here are some figures I pulled out of the Copenhagen Diagnosis. It's a document that came out a few years ago written by a whole long list of climate scientists. What we're basically looking at here are uh, computer model predictions overlaid against real-world data. So basically, they built their models, they ran their models, and then they sat back for 10 or 15 years and waited for the real world to produce data, and they saw how the two of them would uh, line up. The good news here is CO2 emissions, which in the real world are only tracking the worst-case scenario of the computer models. Arctic sea ice 
and uh, sea level rise in the real world are both getting worse way faster than even the worst case scenario of the computer models. Now, this is pretty typical. I am not a climate scientist. I got my PhD in the biophysical ecology of harbor seals. But I've been sort of dropping in on at least the high profile climate change papers since well before the turn of the century. And in all that time, I can remember maybe two cases where somebody reported, hey, this variable isn't getting bad as fast as we thought. In all the other cases, the optimists are wrong and the pessimists are too optimistic. So when people like Guillermo del Toro pop up in Time magazine, this is just from last week, and talk about how optimism is the radical and rebellious option, I've just got to roll my eyes. That's bullshit. Optimism is not the radical option. Optimism is the default option. It is wired into us on such a fundamental level that we are blind to the danger that we are in. So what now? Am I basically here to tell you that all hope is lost? That we might as well start fighting over the last can of spam now because we're screwed? Is there any cause for hope? Well, there's not as much cause as some people would have you believe. But I think there may be glimmers. Because there are people out there who actually do have a more accurate and objective view of the world than most of us. They have perceptions and priorities that are closer in line with, with what the data show. And we have a word for these people. We refer to them as brain damaged. For example, most parents would rescue their child from a burning building. And if they were forced to choose between their kid and somebody else's, they'd probably go for their kid. I can think of maybe one or two exceptions. Uh, because kin selection, right? But if you injure those people, just so, if you induce a lesion in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, that kin selection thing just drops out of the picture. Parents thus lesioned would, at least according to this paper out of Nature, unhesitatingly leave their own child to burn if that meant they could save two or three of somebody else's children. Now, this is not sociopathy. These people still have a strong sense of right and wrong. And in fact, it's a better sense of right and wrong than we have because it's based on rational ethics, not gut feeling. These people don't think that their little genes are the center of the universe. They don't think their darlings are, are the be all and end all. These people would serve the greater good even at the cost of their own fitness. Maybe we should put these people in charge, or maybe we should insist that people who want to be in charge get lesioned, I don't know. Um, there is another group of people, a different group of people, who's also more objective and, uh, and more rational than we are. They are better than we are at assessing their level of control in social situations.